recording. All right, so good morning, everyone. And first of all, thank you for attending this uh, Head Start Type Approval webinar. Let me introduce myself. Uh, my name is Nuria Cayuela. I'm from the innovation team of the homologation commercial vehicles department at IDIADA. And yeah, I am glad to be here and I hope you enjoy this webinar. Um, during today's 90 minutes presentation, more or less, uh, we will review the regulatory framework related to um, connected and automated driving vehicles. And for that, we have here uh, different experts on regulations and type approval from IDIADA and also RDW. Uh, but before starting, um, allow me to indicate some um, guidelines for today's webinar. First of all, uh, you will only see the speakers uh, who's talking here and see the speaker who is talking. Um, they will present themselves once they start their section. And on second hand, we have reserved some minutes at the end of the webinar for you to ask questions. So you can either write them down at the Q&A box that it's available on, on Zoom, or you can either wait until the end of the session where you will have the chance to raise your hand and we will give you permission to ask the question directly to some speakers or, or just launch a general question. Last, um, as you might have seen when you entered, this uh, webinar is being recorded. So uh, we will upload, uh, once it's finished, we will upload the recorded session in the website for you to be able to see it again if you want, or even share it among your, your contacts. Before giving the floor to the first speaker, let me briefly give you an overview of the agenda. We will first start the webinar by giving you an insight of the Head Start project. After that, we will give an introduction to type approval and review the latest status of uh, connected and automated driving regulations at UNSC and EU level. And our last topic will be the revision of the UN regulation number 157, where we will also talk about some of the national legislations and exemption procedures for testing connected and automated um, vehicles on open roads. Um, and finally, we will go to the round table, as I said before, where you will be able to ask your questions. With this, um, I will give the floor to Alvaro Arrugue, who will start with the presentation on the Head Start project. Thank you, Alvaro. Thank you very much, Nuria. Um, thank you very much for the organization. Um, my name is Alvaro Arrue. I'm, I'm part of uh, A Plus IDEADA. I'm, I'm also the project coordinator of the Head Start project. So the idea in its very few minutes is to give you an overview about what is the Head Start project and what are the activities that we are uh, involved uh, as a consortium uh, within the this uh, uh, European uh, H2020, Horizon 2020 funded project. So we can go to the next slide, please, Nuria. So some project facts. Uh, the Head Start project was the project granted in the former Horizon 2020 ART01 2018 call. It's a research and innovation action and it lasts 36 months. We started the 1st of January of 2019. So we are very close to the end of the project. We have made a lot of activities and the idea today is to review them. Uh, the budget is uh, 6 million euros and the consortium, it's, uh, we've got together 17 organizations all around Europe. Um, just a reminder that we have a lot of social media, but you will hear about this in the next minutes. Can we move on to the next slide, please, Nuria? So this is the Head Start Consortium in a nutshell. We are saying that it's 17 organizations from around Europe. So we've got a good presence of the different uh, member states uh, within the project. And this consortium was built around uh, research centers because it's an area where research and development is necessary. But we also put together different organizations that are actively working on different uh, activities related to uh, testing of automated vehicles. So we've got two technical services representing uh, type approval authorities. We also have three Euro NCAP laboratories. We have industry representing the, the project. And we also brought together what, what, what most organizations that are actively coordinating European projects in the, in, the, in the topic. Next slide, please, Nuria. 
So what is the Head Start uh, project about? What are the project objectives? Head Start is aiming to define what would be testing and validation procedures of connected and automated driving functions, including, and this is important, what we have considered within this project as key engineering technologies, a set of key engineering technologies, there are more, which were communication, cybersecurity, and positioning. We are doing this by cross-linking all different test instances or test methods, such as simulation, proving ground, and real world field tests. It's well known that this, uh, all these different tools, all these different test instances are necessary to correctly and thoroughly validate automated driving. And this is all done yep, to validate safety and security from performance point of view, according to the needs of what we have identified as three key user groups, technology developers, for example, industry or academia, consumer testing, AKA Euro NCAP, but not just limited to Euro NCAP, and the object of the meeting today, which is type approval. And we are doing this following five steps. First, first we started some while ago, identifying what was going on there. We are in a very dynamic environment. There are many initiatives going on worldwide on the validation of automated vehicles. So we started uh, with this identification. We followed a stage where we want, when we harmonize all these inputs from the different initiatives, activities, and um, yeah, all the different um, move, ways that are moving around and going uh, towards in the world. And we've been in the last years, more in the last year, working more on, on on going back to going to the implementation, not back, going to implementation in what we call define and development. This all leads us to demonstration, which is what we are currently doing right now in the phase of the end of the project. During this whole process, we also have been very active in the pursuit of consensus building between different types of stakeholders, gathering their needs, gathering their feedback, gathering uh what they would like to have from the project so this has all been done with a dedicated expert group which was created and one of them it's the one on type approval which is the one that is organizing this webinar today next slide please nuria so we are now we've got a lot of information this is part of the activities that were delivered in in the first uh, half of the project but then we want to focus a little bit more on what are the technical outputs that uh, have been delivered and that have been the basis, the basis of the rest of the activities of the project. Next slide, please. And the most important thing is the Head Start methodology, because it was like the first milestone from the technical point of view achieved by the project. The, the Head Start methodology, it's not built from scratch. One of the objectives of the project was to avoid fragmentation, how to approach the safety assessment of automated driving functions. So for this purpose, during the initial months of the project, we made a thorough study of the state of the art at an international, but also within other places that were being organized around national or member state uh, organization. We worked on the harmonization of these initiatives, of these safety assessment methodologies. We included the utilization of what would be common scenario databases that were accessible. And we uh, had in our mind how this testing of these relevant scenarios that were coming from the, from the scenario databases could be integrated in the safety assessment methodology. In a nutshell, we got inputs from many projects. I would just like to highlight uh, at that moment, uh, we had Pegasus, Move from France, Sakura from Japan, Streetwise in the Netherlands, Enable S3, which was an Excel project already finished. We took all this state of the art to create the, the Head Start methodology, which can be found in the next slide, please, Nuria. I will not go into the details, but this is in a nutshell, the Head Start methodology. One important thing to say is that the databases were out of the scope of the project. We focus ourselves on everything that comes out of the databases or how we interact with these databases. And for this purpose, we uh, integrated in a harmonized way this methodology where we have these building blocks, which uh, create the flow of how the testing must be organized in order to assess the safety of the vehicle. If you look into the details, we are working with databases, but we did not left out of the equation what would be the expert knowledge or how the automated driving functions affect how do you need to interact with the standard databases and with the test instances. If you look to the lower part and in color, you will see that we have four test instances. So from uh, proving ground testing, more simulation oriented um, 
testing, for example, X in the loop or virtual simulation. And we also included field testing. It's a little bit different. I will not go into details. We have nice webinars about the Headstone methodology where we explain in detail, but field testing, it's something that it's also important for the validation and for the safety assessment of the methodology. And today you will see some examples of how this is done. Um, next slide, please, Nuria. Yes, next one. Okay, the, what? Sorry, we've got a delay. Uh, stop here, I will explain. Uh, in red, you see highlighted how we have also integrated the key learning technologies within the methodology. If you remember, we're speaking about communications, positioning, and cybersecurity. Uh, for the first two ones, positioning and, and, and position and communications and positioning, it looked quite natural. So it was easy to integrate how the different parameters that need to be included in the scenarios and then there are object of testing of the automatic learning function it was somewhat similar to what we have with sensors and, or uh, with traditional sensors like camera, radar, LIDAR, and so on with the specific specificities. But for example, with cybersecurity, it's a different kind of, uh, of beast, a different kind of animal. And we had to integrate it, but we also had to create an additional block that would focus on cybersecurity. Um, as you will see, cybersecurity has also um, recently made it into regulation from UNIC. Next slide, please, Nuria. So what do we do with this methodology? Well, a methodology is a logical overview of the blocks that need to be done. But to create the procedures, we need to create the processes that are derived from this methodology. And this was also done uh, within the, the first period of the project. And what you can see here, it's a high level map of how the flow of, uh, uh, of implementation of the of the validation uh, uh, testing tool chain and test organization has to be done. So within this and the extended version that that was not included here for, for size reasons, we have uh, the different blocks that include the procedures that need to follow to make a good scenario selection, make a good scenario location, how you should coordinate all the different test in instances of so field testing, virtual testing, X in the loop, how this also needs to have a specific needs uh, regarding proving ground testing. And well, we have an additional branch that you will see on the left of the image uh, concerning cybersecurity, which at the end of the day altogether allows us to make the evaluation of the safety of the driving function under test. Next slide, please. So where do we stand now? Uh, in the next slide, Nuria. Well, we are next one. We are now, as I already introduced, in that stage of the project. The, the project is ending the 31st of December. We are quite advanced. We are now working very hard to have all the different demonstrators in place and also to have the data that is derived from these different implementations and demonstrators. So in the next slide, please. Uh, these are all information uh, that is available in form of deliverables on, the, on our webpage. They're uh, public, they're open. Please just visit the, the Head Start uh, project webpage and you will be able to find all this information, which is partially the object of today, but not the object of today uh, workshop on type approval. But we have worked thoroughly on assessment methods for each of the project use cases. We will explain this in the next slide. Um, how do you prepare the tool chain for mixed validation, where we integrate these different test instances, test methods, work more in the context on consumer testing and type approval, which is done today. How do we get these results? How do we present these results? How do we store these results, which is done in the Euro 3.4, a theoretical approach that now we are working more on the practical level. And also what was the specification of the test for the procedures for these uh, selected use cases. Please visit our webpage, headstarproject.eu where you can also, where you can find and download these deliverables, but you will also find information from previous webinars. We have a blog where we explain in detail some of the things that we are doing, news and more events. For example, and one click Nuria, we have a final event coming soon. Uh, the date is still uh, has to be decided, but it will be announced very soon in the next few days. So uh, stay tuned and also join us in our final event where we will explain all the activities and results of the Head Start project. Next slide, please, Nuria. So next steps, uh, next steps of where we are. Um, we are 
developing and well we have fin finalized the testing tool chain for the project we have included all these different test instances that we were speaking from the beginning so simulation virtual testing proving ground testing on field tests uh, we have worked on the harmonization of queries to these external scenario databases and we have worked on the evaluation metrics so all this is now being applied as we speak on the uh, head start use cases which are three of them uh, highway pilot traffic jam chauffeur and truck platooning and all these use cases uh, behind they have what we call the link project that is actual projects that are working on the implementation of these uh, use cases in where we are applying the HESTAR methodology. The demonstrations uh, are planned uh, by the end of the project, which we are now on the, on the final event. And also the assessment results will be delivered in this final event, which will be very interesting. And I please, uh, as I said, stay tuned because there are a lot of things that will be shown very, very soon. And last slide, if I'm not wrong. So, the activities that we've done within Head Start is we made this a state of the art assessment at the beginning. Also, I have to admit that at some point we need to freeze the state of the art because it's a very dynamic environment, but we had to freeze and uh, move on. So this means that the Head Start methodology that we derived, that we harmonize from previous activities is a living process. We still, there are still some uh, new approaches that need to be integrated, but what we did is a methodology that is scalable enough to get together all these different new needs or different initiatives. We have integrated gets, which is also something that, um, especially in communications uh, positioning has not been taken into account, but there is no connected automated driving without connectivity and connectivity relies also on positioning. So these two gets, it's important that they are integrated in the methodology and they are not forgotten. At the end of the day, the safety of an automated driving vehicle will also depend on uh, the information coming from connectivity. <clears throat> from this methodology, we derived the procedure, which enabled us to create all the testing tool chain, to create the test cases associated to the use cases, to create this pro proposed approach on the evaluation of results. The procedure coming from the methodology enabled us to move on into the project and get us into the activities that we are currently doing, which is the development of this testing tool chain, all the testing itself uh, with the different use cases and which will be shown and demonstrated in the final event that takes place the, in later on this year. So next slide. Just stay connected, come visit our, follow us in our social media, visit the webpage. There's a lot of very good information uh, state-of-the-art information, and on behalf of the Head Start Consortium, which is in the next slide, I stop here and I will leave the room to our speakers today, which will focus themselves on what are the activities related to type approval, which at the end of the day, it's a very important topic. So thank you all for your time and enjoy the rest of the webinar. Nuria, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Alvaro. So with this, I will give the floor to the next speaker, which is uh, Carlos Luján. Okay, so microphone on, camera on, so I am ready to start. Uh, thank you, Noria. First of all, uh, let me introduce myself. My name is Carlos Luján. I am senior manager at the Diada Homologation Division and I am the technical responsible for the homologation of connected and automated technologies. And secondly, I, will, I would like to thank uh, Alvaro for the condensed introduction that he made to a, a huge amount of work that has been done in the previous months with regards to this, to this project, to the Head Start pro project. And as he has mentioned, uh, one of the user groups that is being addressed by this project is the type approval. So let's go down the, the downstream and let's focus in, in this specific area. So please, Nuria, if you can go to the next slide. If we want to speak about type approval, the first thing, the first thing we need to understand is what type approval is. So let's start by the beginning and let's just read the definition that is present in the European regulation for type approval. So Type approval means the procedure whereby an approval authority certifies that a type of vehicle, system, component, or separate technical unit satisfies the relevant administrative provisions and technical requirements. 
I highlighted some words because I think those words are key in order to understand what type of approval is. And now Noria will help me clicking once. And the first concept that we find here is approval authority. When we are talking about type approval within the European context, because there are other models worldwide, but now we are focusing in the European context, the, one of the key elements is the presence of an approval authority. The approval authority means that there is an independent organization, an official organization, which is in charge of granting or in charge of withdrawing the approvals. So we have some kind of judge which is providing the okay or the no okay to the technologies being applied for approval. Second concept, and if you can click again, we have the certification. That means that this approval authority grants a certificate. This certificate provides a certain degree of safety to the manufacturer. That means that when a manufacturer has obtained this certificate, it means that there has been some work behind that guarantees the compliance with the requirements. And last but not least, if you can click twice that time, we can see that we have two main groups of requirements. We are not only focusing in the technical requirements. Uh, as Alvaro said before, there are other user groups that are being addressed in this in this context like for example the internal validation of the manufacturers may be uh, also uh, may use head start methodology in order to do internal validations and in that case we would be focusing only in the technical requirements but when it comes into the homologation requirements we need to take also into account the administrative provisions so this is a very important concept for the manufacturers to understand as well for the other stakeholders and if we go into the next slide, we will see a little bit more in detail how the homologation process works. Because we have seen the definition, we have seen the overall description of the process, but let's see in detail which is the exact process that a manufacturer needs to go through in order to get the approval for a certain vehicle type. First thing, the manufacturer applying for a homologation for a vehicle type approval needs to submit a description of what is going to be type approved. This description in the form of the information document is the overall description of the specifications, the characteristics of a range of vehicles with regards to a specific regulation. So this information document, we can say that is the uh, ID card of the vehicles that need to be type approved. In the next step, and if you can click, please Nuria, this information document is sent to the technical service and for technical service we understand the company the organization which is in charge of the technical and administrative evaluation of the compliance of the requirements examples of technical services we have Idiada here today represented we also have rdw as well as many others around the world and this technical service is in charge first of all of defining which is the worst case to be tested according to the description present in the information document and also to perform the tests that are defined in the in the regulations in order to judge if the vehicle is compliant or not with the technical requirements. This is a very important concept because what I am mentioning now is quite, or we can say that it's a little bit old fashioned right now because I am talking about tests, but we will see in the next slides that this has evolved and this is aligned with Head Start methodology and we are moving from pure testing to other assessment and testing methodologies. So if you can click again, Nuria, we can see that the outcome of the testing performed by the technical service is a test report with the results and the judgment of the compliance or not of the vehicle, together with the validated information document in which the technical service uh, says that this information document is okay and is covered by the vehicle that has been tested. In the next step, and if you can click again, this information document together with the report, the homologation package as it's known, is delivered, is submitted to the type approval authority that will certify. We have seen before that the type approval process means the certification by an approval authority. So this is, or we could say that this is part of the last step of the homologation process in which the type approval authority is granting the certificate to the vehicle type. And if you can click again, this vehicle certificate is delivered to the manufacturer so that the manufacturer can start introducing this product, this vehicle, into the market. This seems quite easy, this seems quite under control, but 
if we need if we have uh, or if you want if we want to have a higher degree of control we need what we will see in the next click which is the supervision of the european commission this is a process that needs uh, a higher degree of warranty especially after some events that we all know that happened into the past and that jeopardize the credibility of the homologation process that means that in the latest stages of the of the rulemaking process the european commission has decided to implement higher degree of control of the homologation process which means that they are surveilling and they are uh, guaranteeing that this process is going to be performed correctly so if we can go to the next slide please noria we can see that in order to comply with this process, there are a series of tools, a series of tools that the European Commission has created. And this series of tools have the shape of regulations, European regulations or regulatory acts. We can see here uh, in the screen, the big one, which is regulation 2018-858, which is the framework regulation. This is the regulation that defines the process to be followed for the whole vehicle type approval in Europe. But this is not the only tool. There are a series of implementing or delegated regulatory acts that support this framework regulation and that uh, introduce some additional requirements or some additional processes. If you can please click, Nuria, we can see that we have, for example, regulation 715 2007 for emissions. If you click again, we will see that we have another regulation defining the administrative requirements. And if you can click again, we can see that we have what we call the general safety regulation which is regulation 2019-2144 as well as many other regulations that i didn't want to mention because we have limited time so if we go to the next slide we will explain some details about this general safety regulation which is key in order to understand this alignment with hester methodology this regulation among many other things like for example repealing the previously existing general safety regulation some people call this regulation general safety regulation 2 or new general safety regulation because this is repealing and replacing the previously existing one as well as repealing many other previous regulations that existed but the key point that i wanted to mention today is that this new general safety regulation is a, is adding to the regulatory framework some considerations on partially automated vehicles so ada systems as well as fully automated vehicles and the way in which those considerations are included in this regulation is by means of naming those systems and also making some of them mandatory uh, starting from certain dates, typically starting from 2022, but depending on the system, may be introduced later in the, in the market. So if we can go to the next slide, please. We can see that those functions uh, are we have a, a huge variety of new functions introduced by this new general safety regulation if you focus on the drawing on the right side of the of the picture of the slide we can see that those functions are divided in six main groups the first of them is requirements related to passive safety second one is requirements for vulnerable road users third one is requirements for vehicle braking steering and dynamics then we have also requirements on electronic systems of the vehicle requirement of vehicle and user behavior and finally some general safety requirements for the vehicle uh, if you can click nuria the main focus today is those two that i have highlighted so electronic systems as well as driver and vehicle behavior because those are the areas which include some regulatory acts that are related to those automated functions or highly assisted functions some examples of those functions introduced today are intelligent speed assistance driver drowsiness and attention warning advanced emergency braking systems or emergency lane keeping systems if we can go to the next slide please we can see that as i said before the regulation mentions some of the systems and introduces the dates in which those systems will be mandatory so if you can click again we can see that this regulation introduces the why so the reason why those regulations will be introduced or these requirements will be introduced in the European framework. If you click again, we can see the what, so which systems are going to be introduced. And if you click again, we also have the answer to the question when, when those systems need to be introduced in a mandatory basis in the European regulatory framework. But if you can click again, we see that 
there is one question missing and one answer missing, which is the how. How those technical how the technical requirements for those functions are going to be defined? How those functions need to work? So the answer to this question is already answered by the European Commission. And in order to understand that, we need to focus in this picture. In this picture, we can see that we have two main sources of regulations. We have UNEC WP29, which we will explain a little bit later, which is the World Forum for Vehicle Regulation Harmonization from the United Nations. And also we have the European Union ecosystem. Both uh, forums are dealing with vehicle regulations and each of them has a different list of priorities, a different list of systems that need to be regulated. We can see that in most of the cases, the area of interest is the same, is coincident, but we can see also that there are some areas that I uh, highlighted here in which the framework for the European Union is asking for some requirements that are not covered by UNEC WP29. So the strategy for the EU, of the European Union in terms of getting the technical requirements and, uh, and taking them for the own regulatory framework is in the first case, if the regulation already exists within the WP29, it directly adopts it. So we have some examples like, for example, regulation UN regulation 152 on AEV has been directly adopted for the European Union. So from 2022, when a manufacturer wants to get a type approval for a vehicle, it will need to comply with the requirements of UN Regulation 152. But we have some other cases. We have cases in which the European uh, Commission has a priority that has not been addressed by the UNEC, and then the European Union needs to adopt or to create a brand new EU regulation. Examples of that. In the field of, for example, general safety, we have the registration plate of the vehicle. This is something that UNEC has not addressed. And because of that, the European Union has published a regulation on registration plate. And then we have an intermediate case in which there are some requirements already published by UNEC, but those requirements are not 100% aligned with the needs of the European Union. In that case, the strategy of the European Union is to adopt a new regulation, a new EU regulation that mentions some paragraph or even mentions the name of certain regulations that have been created in the UNEC level. But as the main focus of regulation for EU and the main technical forum is the UNEC, if we go to the next slide, we will see which is the way of working of this structure. UNEC is the United Nations Economic Commission for Europe. It's a huge structure with certain divisions, committees, etc. And if we go down, we can see that within the Inland Transport Committee, we have the road section with a huge number of working parties. And one of those, which is WP29, is the World Forum for Harmonization of Vehicle Regulations. The aim of this working group, the, the scope of this working group, is to develop regulations that may be used worldwide. Uh, as this is quite a big target and it's not easy to achieve, this WP29 is divided in, certain, in a certain number of expert groups, which is dealing with different topics depending on the technologies. So these expert groups include, for example, GRBP for noise and tires, GRE for lighting, GRP for pollutant emissions, GRSG for general safety, GRSP for passive safety, and the most important one today, which is GRVA, which is the expert group on automated vehicles. So if we go to the next slide, we can see that the main focus of work of the automated uh, driving working group has been defined by what we call the framework document. This is a document which had two main purposes. The main purpose, the, the first purpose of this framework document was to establish the priorities in terms of rulemaking for automated driving within the UNEC context. So it defined the priorities, which systems, which functions needed to be addressed before, and also it defined the timeline, some deadlines in which the regulations needed to be available so that the manufacturers could use them, so that the uh, approval authorities could grant approvals to those systems in order to guarantee the, the safety. And then the second purpose of this framework document 
was the definition of a series of, we can say, hot topics uh, that needed to be addressed in order to uh, get a robust regulatory framework. If you have a look at the picture, you will see that it's quite in line with what Alvaro has, exp has explained before, because we are talking about uh, how the methodology for evaluation of those systems needs to be created. And in the list of, uh, of these hot topics, in the list of the safety vision, we can see that the main areas that needed to be regulated are the system safety, which means how do we define that a vehicle is safe? So it could be quite in line with the SOTIF, with the safety of the intended functionality. We also need to focus in the objective end detection and response, how the vehicle understands the environment and how it reacts. The event data recorder, the black box of the, of the vehicle, the software updates. I will skip the next one and I will jump into the human machine interface especially interesting for the case of level three vehicles in which the relationship between the human driver and the machine driver is really important. The fail-safe response, what happens when the, when the system uh, is under a failure? So how does it need to react? So it's quite related to functional safety. Then we also have cybersecurity, as Alvaro already mentioned in the context of Head Start. And we have the operational design domain. It's also important to define where the vehicle can drive in automated mode. And I left for the, for the last one, the validation for system safety. This is essential here because the validation for system safety is in charge of defining how are, you, are we going to evaluate the compliance of the vehicle or of the system with the requirement of the regulation. I mentioned before when I introduced the homologation process that typically it was made by means of testing, but now, the, the new reality, the new technologies available require a different approach. And this approach is being defined by the working group of the United Nations, which is in charge of developing the requirements of the validation for system safety. I will not enter more into detail on this area because my colleague Uriol will come next and he will explain how this validation for system safety is being applied to the specific use case of the ALKS, the automated lane keeping system. So, uh, that's all from my side, and I will give the floor to my colleagues that come next. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Carlos. So, as he said, now Uriol uh, and together with Edwin, they will speak about uh, regulate num uh, UN Regulation Number 157. And yeah, Uriol, the floor is yours. Thank you. Yeah, so thank you, Nuria. Uh, yeah, so after the Hedster uh, methodology explanation by Alvaro and the introduction to the type approval from Carlos Lujan, I will focus a little bit more on the Regulation 157, the new automated link keeping system, because uh, this is considered the first SIA level three system. So it's the first system that uh, the, let's say, in the, inside of the operational domain of the system, the system is responsible of having the actions and the driver uh, is only aware if the system uh, cannot cope with some of the situations that we'll find on the road and then we will take the responsibility. And I will start with uh, some general concepts for testing the ALKLIS and how it's related with the Head Start methodology that we are proposing. So if we can go to the next slide. Okay, so uh, the main idea is that with the old approach of the certification procedure, the, the certification started at the last phase of the, of the let's say, the development of the, of the vehicle. Okay? So we started before putting this vehicle inside of the road. So we did not take part of the development phase. So we didn't were aware about the, the things that the manufacturer were doing during this development phase. What happens now? With this new kind of systems, we need to assess the procedures and how the manufacturer has uh, developed their system. So we want to ensure that the methodology that they are using uh, ensures the safety for these vehicles and these systems. So now we took an important part 
inside of the development stage of the manufacturer. So we are partners of the manufacturers from the beginning of the development phase. So we can go forward. Um, how it is related. So now we have what is uh, well known and, and so called the new uh, three pillars approach where the audit and assessment phase start uh, with the development phase of the manufacturer. So we as a technical service, uh, we are, want to ensure that the development process, the methods and standards applied for the functional safety or the safety of the intended functionality are in place and the manufacturer is currently following these procedures for the development of their systems. And we check the integration of the general safety requirements and traffic rules, okay? Of course, inside of uh, this phase, the manufacturer can use and will use some simulation resource. So here is where Head Start methodology is important because we can create simul uh, and simulate for specific scenarios. And that's very important to ensure that in this phase before going ahead on the development phase, uh, we are obtaining a, a safe uh, system and we are ensuring that these steps are correctly performed. After that, when this phase has been correctly addressed, then we are going to go to the physical certification test. That's well known for all the technical services and for the type of approval process, because normally what we did before with the old approach uh, was to test all the vehicles on the proving ground in order to obtain a certain minimum performance of the systems. So now after the audit and the assessment phase, we are going to go to the physical certification. And in this case, uh, also the methodology of the head store is very important because we can simulate specific scenarios, okay? So we can be more concrete on these scenarios in order to ensure uh, these critical uh, scenarios in a safe area where we can control all the things and there is a lot of uh, reproducibility, reproducibility of the, these scenarios. And after that, when we have uh, ensured that these phases are uh, correctly implemented and the system is safe enough, then we are going to go to the real world test drive where we have an overall impression of the system behavior on public roads. And in the case of the ALKS, we have to fulfill a different set of requirements or, and scenarios that shall happen in order to assess if everything has been correct. If there is something that uh, is not correct or we identify that uh, some scenarios should be uh, evaluated again because we find you know, findings on these final steps, then we can go back to the audit and assessment phase or the physical certifications phase uh, in order to assess also this kind of scenarios. So we can go forward. So now we are going to enter to the ALKS. So as I said, the ALKS is the first system that is considered a SIA level three system. And inside of the definition on the scope, this uh, is only for M1 vehicles, so the passenger car vehicles. And it's a system that is activated by the driver and keeps the vehicle within its lane when it's traveling at lower speed. So uh, right now, this system is only allowed with less than 60 kph, okay? So we can only activate this system when, uh, or like a traffic jam. And it's controlling the lateral and longitudinal, mo longitudinal movement, movements of the vehicle for extended periods. And what is important is that without the need of further driver input. So only in the case that the vehicle requires for the help of the driver to take the responsibility, then the vehicle will warn the driver and the driver with a transitional demand will take the responsibility of the, of the activity of the vehicle. So the basic idea of, of or constraints where this uh, system can be activated is roads where pedestrians and cyclists are prohibited. So in this case, are highways. Uh, there is a physical separation that divides the traffic moving in the opposite direction of your vehicle. And as I said, the operational speed right now is only 60 kph. So we can go ahead. next slide. Okay, so if we are entering uh, to the regulation by itself, this regulation is divided with uh, five kind of requirements that we will uh, verify before putting this vehicle on the road. Okay, so first of all, there is uh, an important part related to the safety and the fail safe response. 
So inside of uh, this uh, part of the regulation, what we are going to verify is that the vehicle is fulfilling a set of requirements regarding the longitudinal control, the lateral control, and how it behaves uh, with the road users and the interaction with all the other vehicles. Okay, So there is a, a huge list of the requirements that this system shall fulfill on, in order to put it on the road. After that, and also very important for all these vehicles that are having automated and connected systems, is the human matching interface and operation information. Okay, So the driver shall be aware about what the system is doing. Okay, And if the system requires to have the responsibility again to the driver, that's something that shall be regulated, and it's clearly identified inside of the regulation. After that, we are going to the object and event detection and response. So that's also uh, a big important part. So uh, this regulation defines uh, the range of the radars and how it's the minimum performance of the radars or sensors that is using the vehicle in order to have this system in place. Okay. And finally, the last two ones are the data storage systems for automated systems. So it's well known that uh, the United Nations and the European Commission is creating uh, new regulations that will address these aspects, but right now, at the moment that uh, this regulation was published, were not into force. So the regulation by itself has introduced uh, new specifications about the data that shall be collected by, by the vehicle and the system itself in order to be aware of uh, the specific data in case that there are some accidents and, or some collisions or uh, different uh, situations that can be dangerous. So in this case, the, the vehicle system is uh, collecting all the relevant data in order to have a database and be able to identify if the fault has been by the vehicle or the system or the driver. And finally, for the cybersecurity and software updates. So there are two new regulations that addresses uh, all these aspects, regulation 155 and 156 for the United Nations. But as I said, when the, this regulation was created, they introduced these new requirements for cyber security and software updates in order to be able to cover what at this moment was not covered by the United Nations regulations. So we can go ahead. Next slide. OK, perfect. Uh, then an important part of uh, this regulation, and that's quite similar with all the regulations that were related to the ADA systems, and that's the complex electronic systems. Uh, in this case, is uh, related to Annex 4, where uh, we, as a technical service, or also the approval authority, uh, pay a lot of uh, importance because we have to assess that the functionality and the system uh, has been developed during all the whole cycle, the B cycle of uh, the development of this system, we shall address that the manufacturer has been following uh, different methodologies and processes related to the functional safety and the safety of the intended functionality of the system in order to uh, ensure the safety and also the security and further steps of the, of the system. So how we perform this assessment? As I said, we are starting from the development phase as a partner of the manufacturer. So we are not starting uh, our work when they have finalized the, the system and, and developed all these systems because we could find different aspects that should be uh, addressed again. And then the manufacturer should go back to their procedures. So we start uh, with uh, some uh, documentation assessment where the manufacturer provides to us uh, the methodologies that he is applying in order to assess the safety during the development phase. And we address all this documentation package that normally is confidential documentation. And we uh, are going to the manufacturer site and we perform this evaluation and audit together with them. So after that, as a second step, there is the safety management system where we analyze the processes, methodologies, and tools that they have used uh, to have these processes in place. And here is where uh, the Headster methodology may be very useful because uh, we are addressing these aspects 
that can be solved with some kind of simulations and scenarios that has been created by the manufacturer in order to ensure that the safety has been proven. So maybe these scenarios can be created with the Headster methodology and proven with the Headster methodology because uh, it's quite important and have a lot of database and also is using some new K, uh, new technologies that are quite important for that. And finally, once we have assessed all these two aspects, then we are going to test and verify that all the, let's say, the functionality of the system is as it has been described by the manufacturer. So we are going to verify on the proving ground that the system is doing what uh, is expected. And we are going to create some specific scenarios that may be more difficult or not. So we want to recreate these situations. And finally, regarding the failure mode effect analysis, we are going to perform some failures to the vehicle and to identify if the vehicle is doing what is expected. So the manufacturer has to take into account that some failures may happen to the vehicle and what should happen to the vehicle in these cases. So we can go ahead. So as I said, simulation is very important for uh, this assessment of the complex electronic system. And actually, this regulation is one of the regulations, the ALKS, that is introducing new aspects or new provisions for the simulation. So the regulation itself allows to the manufacturer to show through simulation some of the aspects that are required by the regulation. Okay, so here we have uh, just a paragraph that uh, is introducing this aspect. So it is determined by a general simulation program. So the simulation program uh, is something that can be used by the manufacturer. We are going to validate this program. And after that, if everything is correct, then the simulations may be taken into account in order to assess the safety of uh, a specific part of the function. Okay, so we can go ahead. So which simulations can be created for the ALKS? The, they are also defined by the regulation. So in this case, we have uh, some good in scenarios where some of the parameters that should be taken into account are also defined. So first of all, that is the good in a scenario where uh, the other vehicle is suddenly merging to in front of the ego vehicle or vehicle. After that, next slide, we have also got out the scenarios. So the other vehicle is moving to the other lane, but in front of this vehicle, we have some objects and some obstacles that may require to the ego vehicle to, the, to have a high braking demand or an emergency braking demand. And finally, deceleration scenarios. So we can go up to 60 kph, that is the maximum speed uh, that is allowed by, by uh, our system. And the vehicle that is in front of us may break suddenly, so we have to uh, perform an emergency braking. And these are some cases that can be simulated and can be recreated through simulation. As I said, the Hetzer methodology may be very useful and may uh, have an important impact on the validation of these systems because it can be used by the manufacturer on the development phase, but also by the type approval process because we can validate it and we can use as a technical service or as a, an approval authority. Next slide. And finally, once we have addressed all the simulation and all the assessment and audit that we are going to perform to the manufacturer, then of course, we are going to put uh, these scenarios in place on the proving ground. So there is a limited amount of scenarios that we can recreate on the proving ground and they are more or less clearly defined on the ILKS regulation because they are regarding the lane keeping, the collision avoidance, following a lead vehicle, lane change of another vehicle uh, to our lane or to the other lane, the stationary obstacle after lane change of uh, the lead vehicle, and finally, the field of view test that is more related to the sensors that are inside of the vehicle. Okay, so I said that these uh, scenarios are more or less defined in the regulation because the, the regulation does not define speeds, does not define uh, which kind of road. So uh, it's quite open and the technical service may choose in which situations we should test, okay? So in this case, 
we could use also the Hester methodology in order to have a clear idea of which parameters we should address in order to have a more clear view of the safety of the vehicle and to cover more aspects or more scenarios of, uh, of these vehicles and obtain more or ensure more the safety. Okay, next slide. And finally, once we have performed these first two pillars of the three pillars approach, then we are going to go to the real world test. Okay. So here, the real world test, it's also uh, a list of the things that we have to fulfill in order to have uh, the final certification procedure. So this list is just the one that is uh, showed here. So during all these the kilometers that we are performing on the real world, we have to find a prevention of the activation of the ODD conditions. So uh, we have to drive in a road that it's not uh, exactly the ODD for this system, we have to fulfill or the system shall not violate the traffic rules. Uh, there shall be the response to a planet event, so something that is planet by the vehicle and there is a, a braking that is also planet, but also response to an unplanet event. So during the trial that we are performing on the real world, we have to find something that has been unplanet. Uh, there shall be the detection of other road users in front and on the sides, of course system override of, uh, of the system. So we have to override in different situations, maybe with the steering wheel, also with the brake pedal or different kinds of ways that we can uh, override the systems. And finally, uh, we have to address uh, which have been the vehicle behavior with regard to the other road users in different situations. So the cutins, cutouts and so on. So in this case, maybe the Hester methodology uh, is not applicable at all because it's uh, something that real that we are performing in open road uh, with the conditions that we don't really know because it will happen what uh, will happen depending on the, on the day. But on the first two steps, on the audit and assessment, and also on the proving ground, we can address um, more most of the aspects with the Hester methodology. And we can go to the next slide. Uh, so just uh, for your information, as I said, uh, this regulation is only for systems that are going to up to 60 kph, so it's limited to 60 kph. But on the in the informal groups or the United Nations specific task force where uh, they are dealing with this regulation, they now are talking about extending this function to 130 kph. Okay, that is a huge step because some of the requirements should, ch should change and also the way to evaluate it uh, should change. It's not the same a traffic jam that than a highway assist and also to allow the autonomous lane change. So uh, as we said, this system now is only, of, only for longitudinal and lateral control, but inside of the lane. So cannot change the lane uh, automatically. And in this case, they are introducing this kind uh, of function also inside of the system. This will be the first steps. And in a further step, they will include all the other categories of vehicles, so buses and coaches and also trucks. And we can go to the next part. OK, so I will also uh, explain this part uh, regarding the Spanish approach about uh, testing the ILKS. So we can move to the next slide, and I will give you uh, an overview. So what happens, as we said, the, the last pillar of the three pillars approach and also the, inside of the requirements of the ALKS is that this vehicle shall be tested in open road. What happens that, uh, for example, here in Spain, and uh, as it happens on uh, maybe almost all the countries in Europe, you cannot go uh, on the open road with a system that is not, has not been type approved before. Okay, So we have to ask for a license exemption in order to put this vehicle on the open road in order to test for the ALKS regulation. So here in Spain, this uh, is regulated uh, by the Traffic Management Responsible Authority, that is the Directorate General for Traffic, and is regulated through the instruction that is shown here, 15B 113. This is an authorization to conduct tests of research for automated vehicles on roads that are open to general traffic. So it's in a specific uh, instruction 
for this kind of cases where the manufacturers want to test. In this case, is the technical service or the approval authority who wants to test on the open road, but has also to fulfill all the requirements. So this instruction uh, has been issued in November uh, 2015. We uh, had the new date, November 2020, where we changed it a little bit in order to adapt to the new systems of the market and the new functionalities that were appearing. And finally, in 2021, we'll, we, we will have a new update with some uh, administrative uh, provisions that are changing. Okay, we can go to the next slide. Here we have more or less the procedure that we have to follow for the uh, instruction of having the license exemption. So of course, uh, it is divided on a first step that we have to show uh, some technical documentation where we ensure that the vehicle or the other systems of the vehicle uh, have been type approved or the vehicle is safe enough and it's uh, registered. So we have a kind of a, of a list that we have to follow uh, and we have to present to the DGT. And this application, well, of course, we have to perform a payment and, and so on and to provide the report from the designated uh, technical service. And uh, after that, after, the, after this part of the technical documentation, we have to perform a safety inspection of the vehicle that also includes some dynamic testing. This is the dynamic test that we'll explain a little bit uh, in, a, in, the, in the following slides. Uh, includes mainly uh, some provisions in order to override the system. So what is important for the Spanish authority, <laughs> sorry, the Spanish authority is that uh, the driver is able to override the system in any case and to take the responsibility if uh, there is something that is not correctly understood by the system or there is a dangerous situation. And finally, once everything has been assessed and the corrections has been performed and so on, then the technical report is sent to the DGT and is approved. Okay, if it's approved, we can drive to the, to the open road. So next slide, please. Okay, so we are going to explain a little, bit, a little bit on the dynamic test that we have to perform on the on the vehicles in order to, to assess the safety and if we can go to the open road. So we have a part that is regarding the conventional driving. So these are some simple tests to check the safety of the system and include some accelerations, braking, steering, and speedometer uh, functions that are very simple because most of them, as I said, uh, can be some type of proof systems. So there is no problem on that. And everything uh, may be performed in a couple of days and are quite simple uh, steps to, to be performed. And finally, what is most important is the override uh, parts. So we want to ensure that we have different ways to override the system and uh, we can fulfill some kind of performance of the vehicle. So that simulating that we find uh, something that is not clearly identified by the vehicle and we want to override quickly and to change the, the lane or something like that. So these override tests are mainly for the steering, the braking, the throttle and the emergency button. So normally the Spanish authority requires to put an emergency button where the, the system can be overridden. So next step. Next slide, sorry. Regarding the dynamic test, uh, of course, there is some longitudinal control related to the brakes. So these are tests that can be avoided if uh, the vehicle is, uh, or the, the braking system has been type approved by regulation 13 or 13H. But if not, we perform some kind of similar tests as the ones that we are performing inside of regulation 13 and 13H regarding uh, type zeros and type ones. Also, for uh, AABS, the advanced emergency brake at different speeds, and the vehicle shall avoid uh, the impact on, in all of these scenarios. Next slide. Regarding the lateral control, uh, here we have uh, different provisions because uh, some of the vehicles uh, may be guided with uh, some GPS coordinates, line following, or so on. So depending on uh the way that the vehicle is having this lateral control then we may apply different tests and 
the technical service will agree uh, a little bit uh, more or less with the manufacturer which kind of tests we should perform in order to assess the safety of these systems during the when we put in place on the on the open road so we can go to the next slide and finally uh, for test conditions uh, for vehicles that are not able to perform tests so we have found that uh, there are uh, some vehicles and some systems that are not uh, currently defined exactly defined inside of the instructions so new systems are appearing on the market and the manufacturers are developing new, new systems and sometimes we cannot fit inside of these instructions so uh, these instructions has the floor open for also for the system so yeah, it is not limited to the systems that can fit inside because we all understand that technology is evolving and not everything is covered by the current instruction so we have the floor open of that and in these cases uh, it is the technical service who will decide exactly which uh, tests and which verifications we should perform to the vehicle in order to assess the safety before putting on the road so in these cases we analyze the specific features of the vehicle but also we'll propose alternative scenarios for the dynamic tests okay we can go ahead Regarding the functional safety checkings, so same as the other regulations of uh, either systems and the ILKS, uh, we'll have to follow some uh, criteria regarding the functional safety of the of the system that has been uh, developed. So in this case, we require to the manufacturer to provide us a HARA or a failure effect failure mode effect analysis or alternative methods that has been used during the development phase. In order to assess it, we will check it through the documentation and we will select a couple of failures that we can perform to the vehicle and uh, verify that in these conditions the vehicle behavior is according to the documentation. Finally, we also uh, require some electromagnetic compatibility for the systems. Uh, normally, this is regarding regulation number 10 and cybersecurity provisions. So, as cybersecurity is uh, having more importance uh, inside of this kind of systems, then we are also requiring uh, if the manufacturer has taken into account cybersecurity during the development of these systems by itself. So we check it through documentation. And next step, Another slide, sorry. And yeah, so that's uh, the procedure that we uh, are following in Spain previously to put the vehicles uh, on the road. So if we want to certificate an automated lane keeping system of a vehicle, we will have to also perform this test regarding the instruction and this process regarding the instruction of the license exemption. And if everything has been performed correctly and the vehicle fulfills with the requirements, then we could get the approval for the regulation 157. And now I'm giving the floor to my colleagues who will explain the Dutch approach for testing the IELTS. Thank you very much, Uriol. And yeah, we are getting to the end of the presentation. So now Edwin will step in to explain the Dutch approach for the testing of ALKS. So Edwin, the floor is yours. Thank you, Nuria, and uh, also Oriol for this uh, excellent uh, uh, overview of also the general and Spanish approach. Um, uh, to add to that, um, it is, of course, uh, very good to see that we have made a, a comparison, but in effect, in essence, it is not only a comparison, it is an addition. Uh, so I will not uh, repeat what is already said, uh, and I will go on uh, to stress some of the items that are more into the audit and uh, safety management system um, uh, situation and, and auditing. Uh, next slide, please. So to uh, highlight what we are doing with ALTS type approval, um, we focus firstly on the uh, system safety management system approval and system approval. Um, so you see here there are uh, some purple uh, blocks and there are blue blocks. Uh, the purple blocks are more about um, 
uh, safety management system and the blue ones are a breakdown of how do you approve uh, a system or how do you approve uh, an organizational system. So <clears throat> uh, what we try to do is try to uh, do a breakdown of the difficult terms uh, that are in the ALCS regulations. Um, uh, we break them down uh, so it's uh, clear uh, uh, what, what has to be done. Uh, and then you do a check uh, with a field operational testing, as was already mentioned by, uh, by my IDEADA colleagues. Um, and you are trying to find also uh, some reference material. Um, so to, to state this, uh, it means that uh, we are looking for references uh, and we are looking for uh, how to uh, operationalize uh, this ALTS regulation. Um, uh, so this is a, uh, uh, a, a concept, this is work in progress, that's what I wanted to say. So uh, I'm also very keen to hear uh, on, on your reaction. So next slide please. So if we go into safety management systems, um, uh, with REW we have uh, both regulation part, we observe it uh, testing and uh, uh, type approval uh, and innovation part. Um, we have a new colleague, or not, not a new colleague, a colleague who is, uh, has a history in aviation. Uh, and therefore, we could also relate easily to what a safety management system should do. And as you see here, this is the ICAO uh, reference, um, <clears throat> which is preparatory for the assessment and test of a product. And here you see the first breakdown, what needs to be done or what you can uh, relate to uh, if we are talking about uh, how to break down this safety management system uh, approach as an organization. And this approval scheme is something that we know um, and we have uh, uh, elaborated that in our uh, vehicle safety and security framework of, uh, of RDW in the Netherlands, um, <clears throat> which will give you um, more insight on uh, uh, what is expected from uh, OEM parts, uh, OEM side. Next slide, please. And here you see that if you break down system safety, uh, we do the assessment of the safety, safety by design, and on the other hand, verification and test. So <clears throat> the, uh, uh, what was uh, stated before is that if you look at uh, Article 155, R 155 and R 156, there are a lot of uh, uh, audit systems uh, being put in place, and it also goes um, uh, without a doubt uh, into 157. Uh, we need to uh, assess if the organization is fit for purpose, and you have to check if the verification and testing really does what it should produce. Uh, so here you see a system breakdown on the left side where the safety by design uh, has been uh, stated. And on the right side, you see where the verification and test should be uh, uh, fitted to. And this uh, uh, also builds on what was presented before. You have to do eventually those tests in real world. Uh, next slide, please. And these tests should cover the entire ODD, as it was also stated in R157. So for a piece of regulation that firstly addresses the uh, automated driving systems for the first time, we can say for a qualitative written uh, piece of regulation, it is quite uh, revolutionary uh, to see what, um, what needs to be done. Uh, that also means it's a, it's a big challenge for type approval authorities as REW and also uh, uh, the colleagues. Um, we have to go into both testing and auditing. So uh, we uh, have a lot more people now in our organization who do auditing uh, and also safety management system, uh, sorry, cyber security management system auditing. Um, but if you look at the ODD, we go back to testing and you see here what was already presented uh, by Iriada very well. So I will go to the next slide. Uh, here we see the biggest problem uh, <laughs> that we have and what we face right now. Um, there is a, a, a need to demonstrate the overall safety target. Um, and I think that is also food for discussion. 
the safety target has to be presented to the type approval authority, but uh, the safety target has to be demonstrated somehow. Um, and we know that uh, in the past we had a lot of discussions that you should drive a million or a billion miles uh, or kilometers uh, before you can uh, say something uh, about uh, the safety of a system. But it is impossible and virtually impossible to do that in software because you need to, to have the new, the, the, the same uh, software and hardware layout. So we need to go into a system where we need certain scenarios. You need certain uh, uh, reference on the floor in the real world to say something about the safety target. And that safety target uh, is something that we, I think, should uh, 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 use the time to, to, to elaborate further. Um, so uh, I'm, I'm really keen on, on working on that uh, further um, because somehow we have to find a way uh, to make sure that this safety target and overall safety target is uh, managed uh, and harmonized uh, all over Europe. Next slide, please. Um, one of the things that we are looking into in the Netherlands is what we call the VDLF approach, which states a vehicle driving license framework, um, which was an idea of uh, um, what if a car takes over the driving task? Uh, what if we give the car a driving license? So we have a cooperation with the people in the Netherlands and the organization that issues driving licenses uh, and do the exams uh, of people. Uh, and we are really into how can we compare what you can expect from a driver nowadays? And what do we think a vehicle, how a vehicle should behave in the future when we have ADS systems fitted into them? So with this first ALKS regulation, uh, we are really keen to do the first real world testing also with uh, like say sort of an examiner uh, on the passenger seat to see how do you relate to if the vehicle was a person or the other way around. Normally it was a person doing the driving, now the vehicle is doing the driving. How do we score? And we use a, uh, the Likert scale score to see how this works. And this is not a pass or, or fail uh, exam, but it is about if you go to real world testing, what do you see and what do you encounter? Uh, and what is the regular behavior of the vehicle? Um, next slide, please. Um, and in the end, um, following up also on the, the feedback loops that are in the new system, we see uh, both for systems uh, development in a safety management system, there is a feedback loop, and there is also um, a feedback loop back to how the vehicle is safe by design and also safe by uh, in the use in use phase. Um, so in the blue bottom line, you see that monitoring will feed back to the approval of the uh, organization and system. And on the top, you see that there will be used mon in use monitoring used to improve the system safety management system as a whole. Uh, so both um, the organization and uh, the, the real world behavior sh uh, shall be monitored and will be feedback fed back into the system. Um, and that's another part that we are really working out at the moment uh, because uh, this type of approval uh, system of the future is um, a continuous uh, system. Um, and therefore uh, we need to uh, assess and uh, react accordingly. Um, that's it for me for today. Uh, and next slide, please. I think that's it. Yes. Yes. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Edwin. Um, thank you very much all as well. We will now go to the round table where you will be able to ask the questions and and yeah, and, and we will answer them for you. So I will stop sharing now in my presentation um, so that you can see the speakers, which I will ask them to, to turn on the cameras. And I think we already have some questions written, or you can also um, raise your hands and we will give you the chance to, to speak. So, um, 
Eva, do you, can you tell us if there's any question? Yes, uh, hello, first of all, uh, thank you all the speakers for this great presentation. And I've seen we have two questions, one in the Q&A, so it's from Mr. Smithin. Uh, I assume there is a project deliverable describing all this. Is it publicly available on the Head Start webpage? I think it's uh, maybe Uriol, you can answer this. Yes, yes, of course. So all this uh, work has been uh, summarized and explained it inside of the deliverable of the Head Start project. I cannot tell exactly which the deliverable it is uh, because I cannot remember it exactly which one. But uh, all the deliverables will be published on the Head Start webpage. And this one is related to the license exemptions, not only in Spain, but uh, also on the different, uh, different countries of the European Union. So we have added a different approach of the different countries. So you will not only find our approach from Spain, so also the Dutch, uh, Dutch approach and some different approaches for, for these different countries. If I may jump in, a good way to start is Deliverable 3.3. That's <laughs> uh, available in the, in the web page. You've got all the information there. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Alvaro. Okay, we have uh, another question in the in the chat. Uh, it's from Mr. Sonka. Uh, good morning. I would have a question to RDW. So Edwin, I think this is for you. Have you granted type approval according to UN Regulation 157 up to up to now? Uh, that's an easy question. Uh, we are in contact with uh, several manufacturers who are really building uh, these types of vehicles and function. Uh, but it also starts with the assessment of 156 and 155. So uh, the answer is strictly no, we have not granted type approval. Um, a few reasons. Uh, First of all, it will be in effect probably from July 2022 in Europe. And the second part is uh, we are building uh, these systems as, as, uh, at the moment and doing the first work on uh, cybersecurity management system uh, analysis and auditing. So yes, we started and yes, we are in contact, but there is no granted type approval yet. I think that goes for Idiata too, somehow. Yeah, Mr. Sonka said, thank you very much for the, for the feedback. So more questions in the Q&A. Uh, this one also from, for Uriol. A UN uh, 157 gives more freedom to the technical services. What are the biggest challenges to ensure repeatable and steady quality when some scenarios can be designed by each technical service? Yeah, so of course, uh, that's a good question. And that's why we, we want to, uh, to have this uh, Head Start methodology and our approach uh, to use this approach to also to create this kind of a scenario. So for us, it's very important to uh, identify exactly uh, which scenarios are relevant for the type approval, OK? And uh, having this methodology, we can address uh, these topics. So we can identify which kind of a scenarios we should test and we should simulate. So first of all, we should simulate on the assessment phase. And after that, having this clear, we want to ensure which, which of these scenarios uh, should be tested in the proving ground in order to uh, have a clear idea of what will happen on the, on the road, OK? So that's something that can be solved by the Head Start methodology and our proposal. And uh, after that, uh, we have to also uh, assess the, the performance on the real world test where it's more difficult uh, to have repeatability of, of these scenarios. So the, the most important part maybe is the one that we will take part on the, on the proving ground and the simulation phase. Thank you very much, uh, Uriel, for your feedback. So uh, we can go for the next question from Mr. Kuipers. 
Does human and AV accident historic statistics have a place in the assessment process? Maybe I can take this one. I would say that, of course, this is taken into account during the assessment process, especially at the time of selecting, as we also said before, selecting the applicable scenarios, the scenarios that are more relevant, in order also to choose which is the method to be used for the assessment of a certain scenario if we go into the proving ground, if we simulate it, or if we do it, or we try to reproduce it during the open road traffic. So, of course, the most critical scenarios are to be simulated and not and not tested in, in reality. But before that, there is an important step where this information, this information about occidentality is taken into account, which is the moment in which the regulations are being created. Because at the end, the creation of the of the regulations is mainly based in a problem that exists. So before creating a regulation, we need all the all the information that may be relevant. And of course, this uh, information on, on accidents is relevant. And later on, there is a further step in the process, which is the continuous compliance, as already was introduced by Uriel, which will require some feedback from the vehicles on the road to the authorities so that the authorities can get live information about accidents that may have been created by automated driving technologies during their life cycle. Yes, okay. and also I, I would like to add that uh, the Headstart methodology is uh, using different databases for from Pegasus and, and so on that maybe Alvaro could, could add more information on that, but these uh, databases are taken into account uh, these kind of scenarios. Yes, uh, <laughs> regarding this, well, with the Head Start methodology, uh, what we did is that we are open to different standard databases. So there are already existing accident databases like EDAS and, and other initiatives at European level. Uh, but this certainly they are not enough for the needs of connected automated vehicles because they are uh, relying on the very good information. Eh? Uh, gathered from many years of uh, non-automated vehicles. So we have a good representation of how non-automated vehicles crash. That's also one of the reasons of the approach of the, what is called the scenario-based validation approach with, and the standard databases, which are trying to build, to create this set of minimum scenarios or this set of scenarios that then can be used for automation. But it's tricky because as we do not have, it's a chicken and egg problem as we don't have automated vehicles on the road to gather statistics of how automated vehicles will crash, uh, we are not uh, allowing to get automated vehicles on the road. So at, at one moment, we need to close, the, to break this um, non-virtuous loop, let's say that way. And here, for example, there is a lot of initiatives working on the simulation side. So micro simulation sites, how do we create, identify these scenarios in advance? So we have a, a level of certainty when allowing uh, vehicles on the road. So I'm not saying that the current uh, statistics are not useful. They can be accessed. Uh, and there were other initiatives at European level, like you drive and so on. There are many activities that we take them, but this gives us a glimpse of what is the, 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 the needs in terms of the scenarios for automated vehicles. And many initiatives going in this direction right now, eh? from Pegasus, uh, BNB methods, uh, Streetwise, for example, from TNO. Uh, safety pool in the UK, we are starting to see there are a number of scenario databases that, that are making different field operational tests focused on automation and starting to fill up these scenario databases so they can be integrated in the whole uh, safety assessment methodology. Just a point there. Um, thank you, Alvaro. We are running our time. Well, we are actually at the end of the of the webinar, I will just say that if the speakers have time, we have three more questions, four more questions, if you can stay maybe four minutes more and, and we answer them, that would be great. For all the rest that are leaving, thank you very much for your attendance. So Eva, can you ask the next ones? Yes, uh, sure. The next question is, is from Ellen Wesling. How can we prevent problem shopping for the lowest bar? Yeah, that's a good one. I can answer that. Um, um, 
we are as a, a European member states all part of forum so uh, the, the real issue is uh, we can do that together um, but we can also like we do now in Hesper uh, disseminate what we know and state uh, that we are working on it this is work in progress um, one of the things uh, to keep in mind is that car manufacturers know they are in a new era uh, and they know uh, that they don't want unsafe systems. But we will eventually see um, uh, that there is a need to keep on improving. Uh, so the in-use phase and the monitoring part will also make sure that uh, we will encounter failures and then we will uh, uh, give, have time to improve that. You know, um, So we try to do everything beforehand, uh, but the new system is not a fire and forget system. It is not we give a birth certificate to a car and then you're uh, free to sell everything. We are in the era of um, we will assess a vehicle. Uh, there will be self-assessment methods. There will be extensive testing cross-border uh, in, in different countries. Uh, so the system has also a few uh, items in it to make sure we keep uh, the, the, the general level of uh, uh, of competence very high. Okay, thank you very much for your for your answer. So, if you want, we can move on to the next question. is from Bastian Pruger, and it's also for you, Edwin. You were mentioning a Dutch driving license for AVs. Is that concept or also part of Head Start? Where will it fit in type approval versus NCAP versus driving license? Uh, yeah, good question. Um, <clears throat> it, um, it is a concept that we started in the Netherlands and as RDW, we are part of Head Start. Uh, this is not a basic part of the Head Start, but we, uh, uh, we feel that doing testing on pre-selected scenarios will not be enough in the end for everything. Uh, and that's also why uh, real-world testing uh, needs, needs to find a new type of reference. Uh, and we are basically adding a reference to that uh, equation, which is what if uh, uh, we see it as a type of uh, uh, driving license for the vehicle, and we use the information we have on uh, examining people already and see what that brings us. Uh, so this is not a part of uh, the regular type approval, uh, it is uh, uh, not a mandatory part. Uh, it is something to gain extra knowledge and experience with. Um, and we also have, uh, uh, of course, discussions with NCAP to see how we can go into more detail on testing of new ADS functionalities. But that's on NCAP itself. Um, and it's not a regular driving license and it's not in driving license uh, regulations. So I hope that answers your question. If I may add something here, Edwin, if you remember the HESA methodology presented some time ago, uh, I highlighted that we were including um, open road tests within the methodology and the test instances. And this was not by chance. This was also part of the harmonization process. So, for example, the, the Dutch driving license and, and open road testing. And now it's been introduced also in the, in the pillars that were presented this was done on purpose because it's part of the safety assessment methodology uh, yeah. together. So th this was not by chance that we put it there. Yeah, because and we also have very the... good. Yeah, yeah. No, but I, I wanted to make explicit that it that it was that it is not a mandatory part of uh, the basic procedure that everyone should do uh, a driving license like uh, uh, system in their country. Uh, so thank you for the add-on. Yeah. Okay, uh, next question is for Martin Mullen. Uh, when can we expect automatic lane changes to be permitted in ALKS regulations? I can take this one if you want. Uh, as Uriel explained, this is currently under discussion in the regulatory forums. This is part of the special interest group on ALKS, which depends on the GRBA. And the discussions are ongoing. I cannot tell anything about the timing because timing it's usually depending a lot on certain factors. One of them 
being the interest of the industry, the priorities of the regulators. In that case, what I can say is that the industry is really interested in that. And in fact, the industry pushed a lot in order to expand the scope of this regulation. And we may expect the timing to be much faster than in other regulations. Also in the past, typically the lead time for a new regulation to be published may be in the area of five to seven years. So it was quite a long timing in order to get a new regulation. But currently the amount of resources devoted for rulemaking is much higher and the pace of the meetings is also much higher. And we may expect new regulations to be published in a time which is around two years or so. Okay, thank you very much, Carlos, for your answer. And the last question from the Q&A is uh, from Jumpen San. Do these test methodologies also apply to connected automatic driving where wireless communications with other vehicle and road infrastructure play an important role? Or are there additional regulation and or technical work needed to, to cover connected automated? I can I can answer this one okay. from the technical point of view, but maybe you want to answer first. <laughs> yeah, I, I was saying that I, I can answer from the administrative point of view, and maybe Alvaro can provide some more details about how <laughs> okay. it's been considered in in Head Start. So that's that's a good point. Um, this is something that currently is not included, for example, in a LKS regulation. So the, the the inputs considered for the actions or the decisions of the vehicle come all of them from the vehicle itself and its sensors. But of course, this is something that in, in the discussions in the regulatory forums is taken into account. And every time that there is a new discussion for a new regulation or every time that there is a new function or that there is a new feature on vehicles, this is something that is included. And the connectivity is something that has been considered from the beginning. What happens is that with the functions that have been regulated, regulated until now, it has not been considered a strict priority. And then those functions are, are limited to, I would say, self-supporting functions from the vehicle, which do not require external connectivity. Okay, and then I, I go for the technical no? uh, now. And I hope you can hear me because I'm experiencing some issues with the internet, but I hope you can hear me. In, uh, in yeah, from Head Start point of view, from the, from the methodology point of view, we made some efforts to understand how connectivity, if it's an enabling uh, function or it's an enabling feature of an automated uh, driving function, how it should be integrated within the methodology and also within the, um, standards that are used in the methodology. So for example, we made an assessment of the different parameters that should be considered when creating a scenario where connectivity plays a role. Okay, connectivity with the, um, uh, especially, let's say that way, especially when we're speaking about B2X connectivity. So where there is a exchange of information between the ego vehicle under test and the surrounding vehicles in the, in the scenario. This was uh, this assess assessment was made. You can find it in the deliverable 2.2. And um, basically, what we have uh, researched here is uh, how these parameters should also be integrated in the open scenario standard. Okay, so when defining an open scenario with its different layers, how where current version of open scenario um, already covers. Uh, connectivity and positioning related items, but also what would be needed to be included as parameters within the scenario itself. Uh, it is also important uh, to understand that there is now a lot of efforts on creating these scenario databases, where at the end of the day, you, got, you want to get real world information of parameters that, well, they are the, as close as they are to the real representation of what's happening in the world. And there's uh, a lot of field operational tests going on or data acquisition campaigns going on. And this piloting is not considering really to get information regarding these parameters associated to connectivity. So we may find ourselves, and this is a, 
recommendation from, from the Head Start project. We may find ourselves in the future that we want to integrate connectivity as part of the uh, safety assessment in simulation and so on, and we do not have real world data. This is just, I'm not saying uh, that this should be done, but it's something that should be taken into account. And the Head Start methodology, it, with this spirit of being as scalable as possible, uh, in the future already considered that these parameters should be taken into account, even though now we don't have so many close to market automated driving functions that are relying on connectivity for safety uh, purposes. They are relying on connectivity for many other things, but not entirely on safety. This may change in the near future with the deployment and introduction of B2X technologies. This may change with the deployment of uh, 5G, especially 5G non standalone, where low latency uh, is short of guarantee through quality of service, but but it needs to be taken into account. Just as a quick comment on this, you might find more information in, in Deliverables 2.2, 2.3, and on, on the 3.x, there's also um, different uh, points where we are referring to communication and position. And that's from my side. Thank you very much, Alvaro. Um, thank you very much all. Thank you for to the speakers and also thank you to the attendees. It's been great uh, having you all here. And yeah, I think we got to the end of the webinar. As I said in the chat, if you have further questions, you can email them to me and we will try to answer them as soon as possible and when possible. And with that, I'll just say thank you again and see you soon. Thank, thank Bye. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank, thank you. you all. Bye. Bye. Have a nice day. Thank you, Sam. Have a good day.